this session is from Julien Simon at Criteo. Um, he's going to talk about how Criteo scaled to absolutely massive volumes using MongoDB. So welcome, Julien. Thank you. Well, good morning. Can you hear me OK? Yeah? All right. Thanks. So uh, well, it's just fantastic to be here. There's no other way to put it. So thanks very much for, uh, for having me here, Tanjen everybody involved. Um, I'm French, so anything you don't understand is my broken English or jet lag. Uh, but hopefully we'll have some time for questions and uh, we can clear any, anything you didn't, you didn't get. So let's get started. Well, first, a few words about us. So as I've said, we're a French company, started in 2005. But really, the current, uh, the current product um, only goes back to 2008. So you know, we're barely five years old. Uh, and we're uh, quite big now. We've uh, reached the uh, 700 employee mark. And uh, it's going pretty well. You can see you know, this is just the employees' uh, numbers. But uh, the, the ramp up of the company, in every respect, has followed this very crazy uh, curve. Um, right now, we have offices in 15 countries, uh, most of Europe, uh, several offices in the US, South America, Asia, uh, Australia, and so on. Uh, but we're really operating in uh, 30 plus countries, 35 or 37 at least. Keeps changing. So what do we do? Well, we do performance display. So we work in online advertising, but we have a fairly unique twist on it. Uh, what's performance display? So very, you could talk about it for days and hours. So let's keep it short. Basically, the idea is this. Um, an internet user is going to go to an e-commerce website and check out some products could be anything, shoes, video games, clothing, uh, travel, anything. We work with many, many different uh, advertisers. And as you know, a large portion of those guys, actually something like 97 or 98 percent, are going to leave that e-commerce website without buying anything. Because they're just checking out prices and comparing, and they're not in, in the mood of, of buying anything. And then, you know, these guys are going to go to the internet and read the news, watch some videos, play some games, go to Facebook, whatever, you know, what we all do on the internet. And most of these websites are uh, using advertising because most of the internet is free because they can make some money with advertising. And well, on those websites, on what we call publisher websites, we're going to get the opportunity to show banners. Uh, and so at the time uh, of the internet user visiting that website, in real time, our platforms are going to get called. Uh, and we'll get the opportunity to show something. Uh, so we'll have to make some decisions in real time. And I'll give you more details about that. Um, so let's say we're, yeah, we want to show a banner to that internet user and well, we're going to show actually a very highly personalized banner, not just a random static banner, you know, what I call carpet bombing banners. We don't do that. Every single banner is unique and tailored to the interests of the user. Hopefully this is a very relevant banner to that user and he or she is going to click on that banner and go back to the e-commerce website. So that's a good thing in itself, because what we want to generate for advertisers are clicks, bring back their visitors to their websites. But at the end of the day, what advertisers really want is sales. And so we're also working on converting those clicks to actual sales. And this is what we do. This is performance display. And we're uh, a global leader in that field. And we're growing quite fast. I've mentioned real-time 
and personalized banners and anything so and stuff like that. So what what do I mean by that? Um, so actually, personalizing banners is not only picking an advertiser and picking uh, a product. It, it goes uh, uh, way further than this. Uh, banners are built from graphical elements, right? So it could be slogans, buttons, colors, uh, background color, foreground color, etc., etc., etc. And so this graphical, this set of graphical elements can be personalized and tweak in real time. And so from a, a, a standard set of elements like this one, uh, we can really build a pretty much an infinite combination of banners. So when we say real-time personalization, we really mean this. We really mean in real time picking the right advertiser, the right product, and the right layout for that given user. And so if all of you were surfing to the same page of the same website at the exact same time, none of you would be seeing the same banner. Some of you would see one, some of you wouldn't. Uh, and those of you who would see a banner, then you would see different ones. Because some of you like running shoes, and some of you like video games, and some of you like you know, uh, airplane tickets to Paris. Uh, stuff like that, right? And so this is all personalized in real time. So, you know, when, when you think about it, we really have to make two decisions anytime <clears throat> we get a chance to display something. First, we actually have to decide do we want to display something to that given user? Do we think we can build something that's going to generate a click and hopefully a sale? And that's what we call prediction. Can we, we're trying to predict the click-through rate of, of uh, uh, chance of success for, for, that, uh, for that exact user at this exact time. And so we're balancing this versus the cost of buying the advertising space for the banner. And if we think the chance of success is very low, then we're not going to spend any money and buy that space. If we think we have a good chance of success, then yeah, it's worth taking the risk and buying that space. Okay. Then once we've done that, we have to recommend the right products. So that's what we call recommendation. Decide what are the best products for that user at this very specific time. So it could be products that you just saw a few minutes ago. Could be similar products. Could be uh, complementary products. It doesn't have to be exactly what you saw, right? Could be smarter than that. So this is what we do, and thanks to that, uh, we can deliver a very, very significant increase on the two key metrics for e-commerce, click-through rate, so the number of ads shown, uh, the number of clicks, sorry, divided by the number of ads shown for a given advertiser, and the conversion rate, well, how many of those clicks turn into uh, actual sales, right? And on the click-through rate, we deliver seven to eight times better than typical banners. So I guess this is why our customers like us. So <clears throat> I've mentioned very high ramp up, um, 30 plus countries, uh, lots of advertisers, more than 3,000 in the world, pretty much all the big names, you know, uh, we're not missing a lot, um, and you know, lots and lots and lots of banner displayed. So you know, at some point, you need to have some firepower to deliver that. And since we're a global company, we have customers everywhere. We have internet users everywhere, and so we have to have infrastructure everywhere. So as you can see, those greenish looking stars, although they're orange on my slides, <laughs> are our data centers. Uh, so three in Europe, two in the US, and two in uh, Japan serving the uh, APAC region. So why that many? Well, first of all, why couldn't we serve everything from France and sleep better at night? Uh, well, actually, no, we couldn't because we haven't uh, 
beat the, beaten the speed of light yet. And yes, technically you could serve banners globally from a single location, but network latency would actually kill your performance. And the slower you are, the less clicks you get, right? There, there have been a lot of studies on latency impacts on click-through rates, and so we, we don't want that. So we need to have data centers close to our advertisers, our publishers, and our internet users. But why do we have multiple data centers in each zone? Uh, well, probably we couldn't find a, a single data center big enough <laughs> to host all our uh, gear, I would say. That's probably the first thing. But the, the best uh, reason for doing this is obviously we want to do load balancing on our sites. And we want to have high availability and disaster recovery. All these data centers are live. We don't have anything on standby. Anything we buy is going live fairly quickly. Uh, and so this, this is creating a lot of interesting problems. Uh, and I'll get to that. And this is where MongoDB will come into play. Uh, as you can see, those European data centers are very close to each other, right? I mean, Europe is small. Our data centers are in Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam. Um, this is like, you know, probably smaller than the New York suburbs. Uh, and so there's no big problem there. But about the US, right, we're on the two coasts, and we have about 70 millisecond latency one way between the two, the two sites. Uh, and well, this creates a lot of issues. We'll get to that. So I've mentioned it, seven data centers. Uh, so we work with big names. But apart from renting hosting space and buying electricity, that's hopefully not uh, going down. Um, we do everything ourselves. So we buy our hardware, we deploy it, we install it, we run it, we monitor it. And we do all of that centrally from Paris. So there are no such thing as business hours for us. Business hours is 24-7 because you can guarantee that you know, when, I have, when I'm having breakfast, something is blowing up in Tokyo. And when I'm trying to go to bed, something is burning in New York. And so our team is working you know, on duty to keep all that, all that stuff running. Uh, and it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, we, we still have very good availability. Uh, that's a conservative number. I, I keep saying I don't want to show anything higher than this because it's really, you know, it's bad luck, so I'm a bit superstitious. But we have good availability. Now, let's talk about traffic. And this is where it gets interesting. Um, on any given day, we're going to get 30 billion HTTP requests, give or take, right? Uh, Mondays are bigger than Fridays, but that's the average. So 30 billion HTTP requests hitting the, our data centers. Um, it's always difficult to give you know, any reference, because people don't always communicate on their uh, traffic numbers. But if you compare that to very large websites, like eBay or you know, people like that, uh, it's a very, very high number. So if we were, if all that stuff <laughs> was one website, it would be a very, very, very big website. So that's a lot of traffic. Um, we serve uh, more than one billion banners every day. Uh, more than that, but again, you know, it's an average. So again, one billion banners, that's, that's a respectable number. If you compare that to you know number of users of large uh, social websites, for example, not to mention anybody, well, it's a very respectable number. What makes our lives our lives very interesting is peak traffic. Um, for HTTP requests, we're consistently consi co sorry cons well you got it. We're peaking at 500k <laughs> requests. <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Uh, and uh, 25, 25K banners per second. Again, that's a very, very large number. Um, if you compare that to, uh, to you know, websites, clouds, uh, well, you know, we're in the same league as those guys. And, okay, that's traffic. But, but again, some, some websites have very, very large traffic and, and they handle it and they don't have seven data centers, so 
what are we doing wrong? <laughs> you know, that's my, uh, my nighttime question sometimes. Uh, well, the thing is, we're taking that traffic and, and we're storing a lot of data. So we're pretty much logging every single request that we get. So if you, if you run a quick calculation, 30 billion requests, uh, that's 30 billion lines of log every day. And that's got to amount to uh, some data, right? And then we have to crunch it and we have to use it for prediction and recommendation and some other stuff. And so has you know, that crazy growth uh, started to, uh, to happen and, 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 and uh, even you know, quicken, uh, we had to deploy some unconventional technology. Because pretty much on any given day, we get 20 more terabytes of data. That's 20 additional terabytes, right? That's not 20 ter terabytes total. That's every day we have to store and crunch and query 20 more terabytes. And so when you do that with uh, you know, filers and you know, the usual technologies, well, <laughs> it becomes a problem very quickly. And so we had to move to something else. And I don't know if I really learned to stop worrying, but for sure, you know, I'm loving HPC. And so we deployed the complete arsenal of uh, open source, no SQL technology to handle all of that. So MongoDB was one of them. I'll explain in detail what we do with it. Of course, we were heavy uh, Hadoop users. We have some big clusters. Uh, we're using Couchbase, but we're really using Memcache, which is now part of Couchbase. We're not using CouchDB. RabbitMQ is also a home favorite. And uh, now we're using Storm and Kafka to make everything a little bit more real time, especially when you have to fetch those logs from Japan and you want results in Europe, not uh, 24 hours later. So that's the overview. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. That's the overview of our platform. Now, where did MongoDB fit in? Well, actually, it's located very early in the, in the, in the chain. Um, one thing we have to do when we start working with advertisers is to get their catalog because the, 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 the name of the game is to show products in banners and well, we need to have some product information. So we need to integrate that. So a catalog is really a product feed which is provided by advertisers to us. Okay, well, today we're working with uh, over 3,000 advertisers worldwide. Uh, so that's a lot of data we need to get. Catalogs are, are what you would expect, you know, product IDs, categories, descriptions, prices, a link to the uh, product image because we need to show that in the banner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some other data. So you know, we have at least one catalog for each advertiser. Some of them are more exotic, but that's the uh, that's the ballpark. Some catalogs are really small, a few megabytes. Some are huge because we have some uh, classified websites um, uh, and, and those are very, very large. So some very big catalogs. Um, it's fairly nasty actually because uh, 30 to 50% of that data changes every day. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge number. You, know, you wouldn't expect uh, any advertiser to tweak 50% of their product data every day, but that's, the, that's what we see. So it could be anything, it could be changing the price, it could be uh, uh, fixing a typo in the description, it could be you know, changing the product URL, anything. But at least you know, it's a change. So we have to import that feed at least once a day into our platform. So we have a, an in-house application to do that that will parse the catalogs in di with different formats. Otherwise, you know, the thing would be too uh, plain. And then it's gonna write that into one of our data stores. I say at least once a day, because for some advertisers, we need to do it faster. For example, if they run flash sales, right? Well, once a day is not enough, because product will go, uh, uh, could go out of stock in a matter of hours. So we need to do it sometimes more than that. Ah, this is where gets a little bit trouble, problematic. 
all our data centers are active, right? So within a geographical zone, so let's say the US, um, we have two data centers and we need to have the same data in both locations. So let's say we're fetching a catalog in the New York data center. Well, okay, we're gonna import it, but fairly quickly, we need to have that data up to date in California as well. And so when you need to do that with 3,000 catalogs, well, it's gonna be less because European catalogs are not available in the US, obviously. But let's say hundreds and hundreds of catalogs every day, you know, it, 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 it amounts to a fairly, fairly large uh, quantity of data with, you know, a long 70 millisecond delay one way. And, well, that was a problem at some point. Those, uh, that product information, as you can imagine, will end up in banners built and served by our, our web servers. But we have so much traffic coming in that there's no way the web servers could hit the database servers directly. So we're uh, heavy users of cache. You know, we have a scary, scary amount of, of memcache uh, servers uh, between the web servers and, and, uh, and the database servers. And well, from day one, Microsoft SQL Server was, was used. And that runs fine for a while, you know? Especially in Europe, where latency between the data centers is very low. You know, uh, probably Paris to Amsterdam has to be something like three milliseconds, uh, maybe four, you know? So it's very, very low. And transactional uh, 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 mechanisms and transactional replication are compatible with that kind of latency. Still, you know, since we have one database, one product database per advertiser, you know, the number of databases uh, did grow very quickly. And we found out that, well, there's a hard limit on the number of databases a SQL server can handle. It's not, it's not even a matter of how big those databases are, 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 right? But if you try to have, you know, hundreds of database on one server, well, the, the overhead management, uh, database management I, I, is just too high. And so you have to spread those databases on servers. Even if the servers are not overloaded, again, it's just a number of databases per server limit. And so you end up deploying lots and lots and lots of servers. And then the sizes of database grow, so I, I, I fully echo uh, what the Goldman Sachs gentleman said about finding the right ratios. How do, you, how do you deploy very small databases and very large? How, you know, one size cannot fit all. If you have a you know, 50 gig database, well, you pretty much need to have a dedicated server for that if it has heavy traffic. And then you can put all the smaller ones on, on, the, on the common server, but you end up playing you know, uh, uh, a lot of tricks and moving databases manually, and that's very painful. And what really drove me nuts is that uh, SQL Server is a black box. And uh, when you have an issue with it, uh, well, you just wait for that progress indicator to, to move, and it doesn't. And after 24 hours, it still hasn't moved. You can still ping the server, but OK. And so it's very hard to understand what goes wrong, uh, even though you, know, you can uh, talk to Microsoft and get support. Uh, for tricky replication issues, you know, they, they're probably as clueless as we were and, uh, and it drove us really mad. In the US, <clears throat> again, it, it ran kind of fine uh, until we hit a, a total dead end in Q1 2011 uh, due to very, very large catalogs, trying to replicate 30, 40, 50 gigs catalogs from New York to California. Uh, and, you know, constant, a constant flow of new catalogs. And it really stopped dead. I mean, one day it worked, and the, the next it didn't. And the main issue, again, was transactional replication over high latency leaks. And so there are so many tricks you can try. You can, you know, uh, do backups 
and, and, and restore them in California. You can try to break the catalogs in smaller pieces. You can do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, you know, it was, it was messy, it didn't work, and we didn't even know what, what we were doing. So, so yeah, we had a dead end, and uh, some of the shotgun impacts on that sign are probably mine. <laughs> so we started to shop for a new DB. Uh, and in that case, well, you know, uh, you have to go very fast because the business in the US was uh, about to be impacted and so you don't have six months to decide. So requirement number one, scale out architecture running on commodity hardware because this is what we do. We don't have any big iron. So to, to us, all, all those servers are Intel CPUs in metal boxes. Sometimes it's cardboard boxes if you ask me, but right. So commodity stuff, no, nothing fancy. We don't need transactions because we can't have transactions in some cases. And eventual consistency is okay as long as eventual means quite soon, right? Not hours. Minutes are fine, but not more. High availability, you know, we're a web company, we never stop. No downtime, avail no downtime allowed. Uh, distributed clusters, because again, we have this active active setup everywhere and we need to have uh, clusters replicating, sometimes with high latency. We need, those, we, we need that database to be requestable. Uh, we, there was a strong debate about, okay, let's put everything in memcache. We don't need any SQL statements. You know, the basic request is give me information for product ID 1234. That's not even SQL, you know, we could do key value. Well, as it turns out, it's, you know, we couldn't only do key value. We had some more things that needed to be handled. So requestability with a SQL-like language was fairly high on the list. Well, open source was, I guess, kind of obvious, but okay, uh, to me at least, um, because, you know, shoot me, but I think this is what scales best. and. Uh, and we wanted to have something open source. You know, we, we, we thought commercial software couldn't move as fast as we wanted. It would be extremely expensive given our, our, our scaling needs. And so we looked at open source. And, uh, but not any kind of open source. Not any kind of one guy project of, you know, SourceForge or GitHub or anything like that. So we were looking for something that we could get support on, you know, with a stable organization really committed to making it better. Um, no license fees whatsoever, you know, over my dead body. Uh, but still, commercial support available at reasonable cost. And we could debate for a long time what reasonable cost is. <laughs> Especially my 10 gen sales rep is not around, but hey, I salute you, Bill. <laughs> right, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, good guy. Easy to learn because we had no time. We have a, a large development team, so no, no way we would spend six months learning anything. Easy to deploy and redeploy. You know, anybody has reinstalled SQL Server clusters here? Yeah? Well, all right. You don't want to do that every day. Easy to monitor because, you know, we need to know very quickly if something's broken. And easy to upgrade, right, again. Migration to SQL Server 2008 took us forever to complete. Low maintenance, uh, well, you know, I didn't want any custom team to r maintain that. That's a very cheap shot at Cassandra, I have to say it. Uh, we looked at it, it scared the hell out of us, uh, especially in Q1 2011. And so, you know, I couldn't justify building a custom team just to run that thing. I wanted it to be easy. And I wanted the teams to focus on the products, not just playing with technology. Multi-language support, so uh, you know, Java, C Sharp, C++, whatever, that's obvious. And ability to export to Hadoop multiple times per day, because the product information stored in the clusters uh, is involved in some of our uh, Hadoop processing. So that's a long list, right? And well, the slide I didn't write is uh, how do we you know, who, do we who did we consider and how did they, uh, how did they 
look with that evaluation matrix. Uh, I didn't want to do it because you know it, we know who the winner is anyway, uh, and um, any any decision we made in Q1 2011, you know, wouldn't be wouldn't be relevant today. I'm not saying we're not happy. We wouldn't choose MongoDB again. I'm saying what I would uh, consider a Cassandra problem or a, a Couch uh, DB problem two years ago isn't maybe a problem today. So MongoDB won, and well. <clears throat> that was the easy part, picking, the, picking a new technology. Now, how do you move those thousands of databases from SQL Server to MongoDB? Well, you try to keep calm, but it's a daunting task, especially with a small DBA team. So you have to go for it. And yeah, database migrations, everybody loves them, right? If you guys have done that, you know what I mean. First step, again, was remember what we were doing this for, and it was solving the replication issue, especially in the US. So what we did is quickly deploy MongoDB clusters only to download and, and replicate the catalogs between data centers, but then we would still push the actual content to SQL Server, and, and web servers would still hit those SQL servers through the caching layers. Uh, because we had no idea if that would really work, you know, if we <laughs> moved to MongoDB too fast. So that was the first step, and you know, it took some pressure off us and allowed us to scale very fast in the US. Then the second step was proving that we could actually remove SQL Server and that MongoDB could survive our insane web traffic. So first step, sub step here was to modify our code to have the web apps talk to MongoDB. That was actually very easy. Uh, and then for a number of catalogs, less critical ones, uh, start to switch them and say, OK, now web servers, web queries for those catalogs are going to hit the MongoDB clusters. But we did this very carefully, right? And I don't think we properly informed all the account managers for that. But, you know, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> And the next step was, OK, let it, let it sit for a while. Make sure that, you know, there is no difference. So you know, measure the business KPIs, the technical KPIs, monitoring, do some A-B testing, make sure it works. And we were really, really, really careful. We're usually not very careful, but for this step, we took our time. Uh, and generally, make sure there are no side effects, um, no hidden problem. And once you know, I was satisfied that things were good, then I said, OK, now you really go for it. And uh, you know, you're going to migrate those thousands of catalogs every day, every day, every day, and start killing those SQL servers. Right? And you need to scale the MongoDB clusters accordingly and make sure you know, they handle the load, et cetera, et cetera. And then you need to add more servers and more shards and more shards and more shards <laughs> and more shards. And while you're doing that, you need also to update all your ops processes, even though, you know, again, MongoDB is fairly easy. Uh, monitoring backups, on-duty procedures, et cetera, they need to be rewritten for MongoDB. And so where did this take us? Well, it took us to 11, that's for sure. Uh, could be even 12. And where do we stand today, right? Uh, I keep hearing we have a very large deployment of MongoDB servers. Uh, is that really a good thing? I don't know. But. All right, so today in Europe, we have uh, 54 servers. So we have 18 three server shards, right? One plus one plus one, so one, one uh, member in each data center. Okay, so you can imagine that, picture that in your head. Every shard is spread over three data centers. We have 800 million products stored. That's one terabyte of data. Keep in mind, 30 to 50% of that changes every day. So the amount of writes we have to do is very, very high. We have about 1 billion requests per day, and we're peaking at 40K per second. And 
350 million updates per day, so that's 35%. Those are the numbers just before <laughs> I boarded the flight. Um, but they're fairly typical of what we see. In the US, uh, we have 14 four server shards, so two plus two, two on the east coast, two on the west coast, 400 million products, 600 gigs of data. In APAC, we have 12 three server shards, two plus one, 300 million products, 500 gigs of data. So now you understand why sharding is the name of the game for us, because when your data set is one terabyte, unless you want to have one terabyte of RAM in your servers, your CFO will allow that when you're luckier than I am. Uh, but you have to shard. You have to shard. And that's 146 servers total. And we started with MongoDB 2.0, plus a few patches that never were really integrated. So there are a few guys here I need to talk about, to talk to. But uh, we moved to 2.2, and we're currently running 2.4.3. And well, that's a big number, right? So that's a big number. So uh, you want the Times Square to be renamed uh, MongoDB Square. But when you guys do that, you know, make sure you have a sign <laughs> that says we have 1 billion requests in Europe on our cluster. So two years later, well, more than that, actually, a little bit more than two years, where do we stand? Well, there's some good stuff. <coughs> Right? So Wayne likes it. It's stable. And I must say that the 243, um, the 243, can you still hear me? Yeah? Yeah? The 243 um, upgrade was, was very good. Uh, we had been running 2.2 for a long time. And uh, we had some, some issues. And 243 magically fixed a lot of problems. So if you haven't upgraded, I strongly suggest you do it. The upgrade procedure is fairly easy. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you're deploying from scratch, make sure you're deploying that. It's easy to install and, and manage. Um, no, no big problems there. If your data sets uh, or your sharded data sets are smaller than RAM, you're lucky. It's going to run fine. Most of what you do is going to happen in RAM. Uh, provided that you don't write too much. <laughs> but if you have a normal application, unlike ours, it's going to go fine. Failover and uh, replication work fine, uh, especially uh, uh, in between DCs, so no problem there. Just make sure, that's one mistake we did, N you need to shard early. So it's, it's going to look like over-provisioning to you. It maybe is. But uh, rebalancing clusters is a, is a long operation. So don't wait until the clusters are loaded and overloaded to add more shards. You're going to suffer. Believe me, we've done it a few times. Can, it, it's going to run for days. Uh, so shard early. Well, there's some ugly stuff, right? I'm sure you recognize that uh, famous character. So, well, if you have a huge data set, uh, or if your servers don't have enough RAM, well, your performance is going to be really bad. Really, really bad. If you write like crazy, especially if you have not enough RAM, your performance is going to be ugly. And if you have multiple applications with different patterns that run on the same cluster, well, forget about it. Um, it's not working really well. So you need to dedicate, as far as we see, you need to dedicate your uh, MongoDB instances to a given application. We still have some scalability issues. Uh, again, I, I, I was very happy to hear the Goldman Sachs gentleman, uh, well, not complain, but politely request, <laughs> uh, you know, something better than master slave. Um, I would add that uh, uh, connections are uh, uh, the way the primary, the, the way the Mongo S is connecting to the primaries needs to be fixed. We have a uh, we have a ticket on that, and we keep working on uh, on the roadmap with Tangent. Uh, but still, I mean, it's still very very positive, and we're quite happy with it. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you, Tangent, for inviting me. It's absolutely fantastic to be in New York and talk to you guys.
this is our part of the R&D team. Um, and uh, it's a great team, so I salute them as well. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very, very much.